than a decade ago, I was not sat where you are now, but sat in your position. Um, and I never left. <laughs> Which is a bit strange. Um, I'm Jen, I'm a teaching fellow here, uh, so I work on curriculum development and student experience, but I also research and um, basically I research uh, spatial interpretation and the intersections between museums and other media. Um, my main interest is literature um, and drama and how those things pertain to the museum space. Um, and one of the things that I, I really like in my personal and professional life is comics. So I'm actually a massive nerd. Um, <laughs> a lot of us are in various ways. Um, so that's what this lecture is going to be about. Um, and I'll just get straight on to it. Um, so this panel is taken from the first page of the comic Watchmen. I don't know if any of you know it. Um, and this photograph was taken from the base of the stairwell at the Ashmolean Museum, which was mentioned earlier. Um, do you see what I see? No? Look again. It's all about perspective. So museums are not just blank spaces in which to store collections, but expressive forms in their own right. They're symbolic structures which express themselves through building layout, the shape of occupiable space, the positioning of displays, their aesthetic qualities, their use of sound and lighting, and their written texts. In other words, they are vehicles for the construction of perspective. And the same can be said of comics, which express meaning through written language and visual media, the drawings, the colours, the shape of the panels, and the gaps between them. The thesis statement for this lecture, then, is that, because of these similarities, we can utilise comic book creation strategies and the methods and concepts for analysing them to understand, critique and perhaps improve how perspective is constructed in museum contexts. Stay with me. <laughs> At the risk of offering spoilers, here is what is to follow. Three pairings of comics and museums exploring three different themes to do with perspective. And by the way, if you do read comics and you are reading The Wicked and the Divine, don't worry, I haven't gone beyond anything that was published in the first year, so I'm not going to spoil it. If you've not read Watchmen and From Hell yet, then it's, it's too late. <laughs> first, a quick digression. What is perspective? What is perspective? It comes from two Latin words, per, meaning through, and specare meaning look at. It is used to describe the accurate rendering of spatial forms through drawing and painting. It is also used to refer to the appearance of viewed objects with regard to the relative position of other objects, including the viewer. And finally, it is also used to describe a particular attitude or point of view. There are then two forms of perspective, spatial and cognitive, and these are intertwined, irredeemably so, in museums and comics. So, Let's begin our exploration. A call back then to the pairings we started with at the beginning. The Ashmolean, the oldest public museum, founded on the collections built by the two Johns Traviscant, opened in 1683 and most recently renovated in 2009. And Watchmen, produced by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons between 1986 and 1987, and the only comic thus far to make it onto Time magazine's list of the 100 best English novels published since 1923. So there you are, it's very good. What brings these two together are the ways in which they use and abuse standard concepts of temporality to construct perspective and experience. And some people have argued that comics are actually the only medium to have bridged the rendering of the fourth dimension, that is time, within the third dimension, three dimensions, of space, and thus produce a present filled with multiple viewpoints rather than a single, simple, linear telling. Wrong. <laughs> He's scary. Um, museums in many cases do still adhere to a typical linear chronology, of which more on its problems later, but there are increasing attempts to complicate this dramatic structure to produce different and progressive vantage points onto human history and culture. For instance, in the Ashmolean's 2009 reinvention was centred on a specific display strategy called Crossing Cultures, Crossing Time, which I'm going to refer to from this point on as C3T because 
it's easier. Um, and this aimed to display the collection in a way which showed civilizations not as isolated creatures, but as, and I quote, cultures that share a connected history from Europe in the West through the Near East and Asia to the Far East from ancient times until the present day. And they achieved this through internal architecture, through spatial integration, windows inside the building, vistas between rooms, with the view of being able to look out onto where they had been and at some point where they would be, through certain echoic objects, such as the lacoon, which appears twice in two different forms, and through connections objects, which embody and describe certain key themes that the museum is trying to communicate through its display. And in this way, the Ashmolean seems to be attempting to create a rich present, a present which layers spatio-temporal experience and expectation, and ostensibly seems to be trying to escape from typical historical formats. But despite the stated aims of C3T, ultimately the telling of human history is, in the Ashmolean, still somewhat linear and still somewhat limited. The collections it presents are predominantly European or Asian, Africa appearing mainly through references to Egypt, and the Americas through Powhatan's mantle, which is displayed as part of the original collection and as something of a curiosity, which is not without its problems. And when C3T gives way to the art collection, what is presented is almost entirely European. And the implication rendered through the ostensibly progressive display strategy is strong, that the inevitable pinnacle of human civilization is European art. And the problem, if you can't see it with the linear structure, especially in museums, it is that it has the unfortunate tendency to position someone, and very someone's very specific, as the predestined zenith of humankind. Wrong. Predestination has nothing to do with anything. Even if there is a zenith to reach, we've certainly not reached it. Definitely not right now. Certainly not when the main claims to that zenith are made by those who are typically middle class, western, straight and white. How can Watchmen help us transcend the deeply <coughs> problematic arrow of time and begin to present objects and ideas in a truly rich and multifaceted way? I think we can learn a lot from chapter four, actually, where it all starts to get a little bit meta. No, I really couldn't think of anything smart. In chapter four, Dr. Manhattan, the blue guy here, he is blue, it's great. Um, he's a scientist, rendered atomic by uh, a lab accident, and he's slowly approaching omnipotence. And in this scene, he both observes and exists within key points in his life, all at the same time, almost using this photograph that he's holding as a portal. He's in a bar in July 1959, and on Mars in 1985, and so are we. We are drawn into his perspective through the use of his narrative voice and through the abstraction of comics which allows us to project ourselves into the characters. We are in the bar and on Mars, 26 years apart and at the same time. It's a very cubist construction, and it renders Doc's experience of time in space on the page of the comic. And the photograph he's dropping and holding speaks aloud what museum objects whisper, that they are the things which allow us to transcend time, to touch what has been, and through the object and memory still is, and what is yet to come. So perhaps a cubist kind of approach to objects and concepts, which renders them from a manifold of angles all at the same time, can produce a truly thickened, rich and intense museum experience. And it will highlight that nothing, no historical moment, no act of heroism, kindness or colonial cruelty ever really ends when you know how to look. We can characterise the next pairing as products of and attempts to work through cruelty. The Pitt Rivers Museum, founded in 1884, is based upon the collection of the excessively named Lieutenant General Augustus Henry Lane Fox called Pitt Rivers, somewhat of a proponent of cultural evolution. Like many of its kind, this anthropological institution has been left a problematic legacy of colonialism. Many of its items acquired by dubious means for dubious purposes. And From Hell, another more creation serialised between 1989 and 1996, but set primarily in the 1880s, also details a story of a particular kind of privilege. It's a fictionalised account of the Whitechapel murders, 
and a speculation upon the identity of the perpetrator, Jack the Ripper. Identified here as the person who was Queen Victoria's surgeon, Dr. William Withy Gull. Both the Pitt Rivers and From Hell rely heavily on theatrical abstraction to produce their unsettling effect. And this abstraction is most pronounced in the ways they deploy light and shadow. The Pitt Rivers is lit with dazzling spotlights which illuminate and foreground certain objects and cast others into darkness. It is controversial for the way in which it has retained its Victorian aesthetic. Some suggest that its outdated appearance speak of accompanying outdated values. But for me, the theatrical lighting is revealing because it makes the place excessive, grotesque. It makes other the old-fashioned arrogance which founded it. Indeed, the contemporary activities of the museum, working with local and originating communities and educating a new generation of post-colonial anthropologists, seems to support that reading. And similarly, From Hell uses light and shade to render horrific acts abstract and semi-fictional. The comic, unlike the Technicolor Watchman, is entirely black and white. Everything is depicted as shadows and lines on a white surface, and Gull's murderous journey and eventual madness is shown through shifts from darkness to light, from a state of unknowingness to his perceived spiritual ascendancy. And it would be easy to assume that that increased abstraction would mean we, ourselves, as readers, are distanced from Gull's heinous crimes. From Hell undercuts this, because the first time we meet Gull, we see him from close behind as a small boy, and then see crucial moments of his growth to adulthood through his own eyes. And we're inserted directly into the story, in Gull's place. Scott MacLeod, as a comic theorist, has a theory about why this insertion is something comics do so well. He called it amplification through simplification, and basically the idea is this, that humans tend to see patterns in everything and we project our thoughts into anything that even remotely looks like a face. So, the consequence of this abstraction is that when we look at a realistic image, we see another individual, but when we look at an abstract face, we see ourself. And From Hell performs this, oops, From Hell performs this explicitly through our identification with Gull. In doing so, it renders us complicit in his murderous action, and we are also guilty of producing death and feeling the friction which accompanies it. And it's a disturbing feeling, and I don't mind saying that I was disturbed for quite a few days after reading From Hell. The fact that I live in a Victorian house with a very dark entryway next door and a semi-abandoned property on the other side didn't help at all. But perhaps it gives us some insight into why the Pitt Rivers is such a profoundly unsettling place. When we enter, we find ourselves looking at diverse cultures from the position of a colonial power. And for those of us who are ancestrally of that occupying culture, there's a discomforting juddering of our perceived civilised and respectable identity because the House of Mirrors, which is the Pitt Rivers, reflects the basis of our privilege and the guilt we bear for it right back at us. The final pairing have a lot to say about the nature of divinity and agency and their place in the contemporary world. The Oxford University Museum of Natural History was found, why do I choose such big words and phrases, rather? Anyway, it was founded in the 1850s after a long period of theological opposition from university clerics. It was designed as a cathedral to science, and you can see that. And in 1860, it hosted the famous debate on evolution between the Darwinist Thomas Huxley and Samuel Wilberforce, Bishop of Oxford and supporter of the museum as a monument to and method of studying God's creation. It is therefore a place filled with tension. The wicked and the divine, or wickdiv, is also filled with tension the power and powerlessness of divinity and celebrity. It questions the nature of both of these things and the shifting struggles to achieve selfhood in the modern world. And both museum and comic are interesting for their uses of spatial construction to build meaning. Stanford Anderson wrote that architecture is a bearer of meaning, and this is certainly true in the Natural History Museum. Its use of the then most modern materials, steel and large plate glass, to construct an essentially medieval style building speaks volumes about its fractious foundations. It even has cloisters around the central great court, and these cloisters display cases detailing the history of life from its origins until the near past. Although the structure does break down at points, particularly at the corners of the building where the cloisters meet, it's still a strongly linear construction. And within the context of the cathedral around it, a sense of divinity and a godly plan is given to life, and thus to us. 
content, space and the final message have been linked in museums since the age of the Wunderkammer, and that's no different here. But the Natural History Museum is an ambiguous institution, and the rigid teleology of the cloisters is dismantled in the Great Court. Here, the displays are thematic and playful, much like this one inspired by Lewis Carroll. I, lo I love this place. It's, it's wonderful. Children have space to explore and run around, and shock horror, they can even touch some of the objects. And the consequence is a highly effective space which encourages and provokes learning. Martin Arndt called it a flea market. How does this happen? I think spatial arrangement has more than a little to do with it, and Wickdiv might be able to help us see why. Comics typically are structured in panel grids. Um, nine panel layouts are not necessarily massively common, but they're a very effective form, and Alan Moore uses them pretty much all the time. From Hell and Watchmen are heavily based on this pattern, and even when they break it with the simple act of combining two panels. It's a familiar structure, like the linear cloister. So familiar that it's easy for the reader to forget that it has a meaning too. In Week Div, however, the nine panel grid is almost entirely absent. Instead, the space of the page is used like the active walls of El Lazitsky's Prown Rooms, which appeared to move, changing shape and colour, and emphasising the relationship between space, viewer, objects, movement and meaning. In Week Div, the space of the page is an agent in the story. Its agency could be read as simply metaphorical, emphasising the fast-paced, fractured, smoke and mirrors world of contemporary celebrity. But I think there's more to it than that. Douglas Volk wrote of the importance of the gutter, the gap between illustrated panels. He suggests that this gutter leaves the reader to fill in the gap, making a leap of imagination. With a regular panel structure, the reader knows when this leap is going to occur, and almost certainly that it will be a simple task to fill with just a few seconds of time. Wickdiv is nowhere near so simple, and its complexity profoundly affects how we view the world of the book and our position within it. Sometimes it leaves no room for imaginative readerly leaps, takes away agency and focuses on creating a forced and intense perspective. And sometimes we're left with large gaps of black, sometimes containing the narrator's thoughts, but with or without the text, what these black gaps allow is a deep and complex imaginative leap. Where, how deep and for how long these two very tiny, sorry about that, um, figures travel on this singular page is left up to us. It could be a few metres and moments, or it could be eternity. And Week Div is one of those wonderful comics which helps the attentive reader understand how to read, how to create and how to make meaning from collections of objects and written words. And it does so by breaking all the rules that the medium has to offer. On this level, it isn't just a comic about celebrity, it's a comic about comics. And in a way, this is what the Natural History Museum does. It shows you how rules of display can work in the cloisters, telling you a story over which you have no control, and whose meaning is emphasised by the space that it's in. And then it releases you into the great court to make your own stories and discoveries from the collections of visual objects and written words available. On this level, it isn't just a museum about the content of science, but a museum about the process of science. Once again, we return to the place where we began, which was always going to be the end anyway. The place which tells us that different media have more in common than you might expect. The place that tells us that objects are multiple and meaningful in three and four dimensions. That tells us that light and shadow create each other and that we are all bearers of guilt. And that tells us that we, and you will be, agents in whatever follows from this moment on. And that there are rules, but sometimes it's better and more meaningful to break them.